For this video, we are going to look at finding the outlier from a set of data, and in this case, a pretty large set of data, and we are going to use technology, and we're going to definitely go beyond what we did in the video that I made for the course. So if you haven't watched the outlier video that I made during Chapter 2, Section 4, please go back and watch that video for Chapter 2, Section 4, and take notes on it. Now, I will, for this video, recap any of the important steps in finding an outlier. The first step that you have to do is you have to find the median. And finding the median is important because without finding the median, you can't find the Q1 and the Q3. These are important numbers because this is where we are going to move from to get our lower and upper boundary or lower and upper fence. Step three is to take the IQR, and the IQR is found by subtracting Q1 and Q3. So if you subtract these two, you will get your inner quartile range, or IQR. Then you multiply the IQR by 1.5. After you get this value, and we're just going to call this um, some value x, then for step five to find your lower fence, you're going to take your Q1 and, and subtract that value x, and this is going to give you the lower fence or the lower boundary. And in step 6, you're going to take your Q3 and add that value x, whatever the IQR times 1.5 was, and this is going to give you the upper fence. Now, you are going to be given problems in your homework that are going to be pretty large. I would say that I don't get a lot of questions when the data set sizes are between 15 and 25 pieces of data. I get questions when the data set is really low, and in this case the data set is pretty big. So let's take a look at this problem that was randomly generated for me, and this isn't going to match your data specifically. The homework system sets up data and just creates new um, numbers every time you do this. And this is a sample size of 54 numbers. And I can see that in this array because there are six columns and nine rows. And six times nine is 54. Now, if I was doing this by hand, I would first have to put all the numbers in order. That is probably where the technology is going to really help you out. But without the technology, I just kind of cross my fingers and hope to see that the data is in order, and it luckily is. From the upper left corner, it goes to the right side, and like a typewriter or a word processor, it just keeps auto-scrolling until it gets to the 54th data point at 431.2. That's the maximum. So the first thing we need to do is we need to figure out where is our median. And what I'd like to do is maybe just a little bit of scratch work off to the side here, and I'm going to go 54. 4 divided by 2. If I take my 54 and divide it by 2, I get to 27. So I need to split this group up into 27 points each. And what I can do here is I can think to myself, okay, so if I have you know these seven rows, I can either count between the 27th and 28th piece of data, because that would give me 28 on each side, or I can think that the middle is going to be where the median is. Because if I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 rows, the fifth row in the middle is where the median is. Now, if I'm splitting the middle row in half, then I'm doing it right here. This is where the median is, this green crayon line between 360.3 and 360.3. This is your median. So technically, everything above the green crayon line is half the data, and everything below the gray crayon line is the other half of the data. And you can count it up if you'd like, or you can see that there are four filled rows with, you know, a half partial row. So now we have set up our median. Our median in this case is kind of irrelevant for the actual computation of the outlier because we really just use the median to find our Q1 and Q3 because our Q1 and Q3 is half of the data before the median and half of the data after the median. So if I do a little bit of scrap work on my calculator, I can turn this on and get to a clear screen and I can go 27 divided by 2. So 27 divided by 2 is 13 and a half. This means that the 14th data point 
out of 27 is the Q1, or half of the data, because 13 plus 1 plus 13 is 27. So this 14th point is going to be our Q1. Now I'll take my little scratch work crayon, I'll change colors just so we can see it a little differently. So I'm going to go 14 pieces from the start here to find the Q1. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Another 6 makes 12, 13, 14. Here is our Q1. Now let's go find the Q3. Now I can go uh, 14 in either direction, top down or bottom up. It's easier to go top down because I've got 12 going from the top, and then this is going to be the 13th and this is the 14th data. Now I can always check to see if I have the same amount of data before and after this Q1 and Q3, but these are our Q1 and Q3 values. So let's put these over here. Q1 is equal to 380, oh sorry, 338.5. Let me tighten that up a little bit here. 338.5, and our Q3 in this case is going to be 393. Now again, if this data set wasn't in order, I'm going to show you a method after I get through this process on how the technology can give you a little bit of a boost. So then we take this, these two values and we find our IQR. And the IQR in our quartile range is taking our 393 and subtracting our 338.5. By subtracting these two, get, this gives me an IQR of 54.5. And then we have to multiply that by 1.5 to give me that value x I talked about over here. So 54.5 times 1.5, that gives me 81.75. So this is the number that I'm going to subtract from my Q1 and add to my Q3 to find my lower fence, upper fence, or my lower bound and upper bound. So let's do that. Um, I've got some space over here, uh, so I can do that here. Let's go with our Q1, which is 338.5. I'm going to subtract my 81.75. And then I'm going to take my 393, that's my Q3, and add that X or 81.75. And now I'm going to find my lower fence and upper fence values, or my lower boundary and upper boundary values. What these values are going to tell me is they're going to say, hey, if I have a number that is smaller than 256.75, then that number is an outlier. And if I look at my data sample, I, I don't have any data pieces that are lower than 256.75, so there are no lower outliers. Now, if I go to the upper part and I add these two together, I get 474.75, and again, no outliers because there is no number higher than 474.75. Now, this was nice because the data set was in order. And if you have a printer, you could have printed this off of the screen. Um, and again, without you know drawing on your own screen, you might need to figure out a way that's beneficial for you. So that's kind of why I want to expand what we did and talk about the graphing calculator. Now, unfortunately, the TI-83 and 84 doesn't have an actual outlier output mode for any list of data. But you actually have to type in the list of data first. So maybe you need a review or a how to type data into this calculator. Now this means that I will be showing you how to get all 54 of these points into the calculator. So have your graphing calculator ready and click on the stat key. The stat key is underneath the delete key so please click that once. And then we're going to edit the data that's in the calculator, so it's already highlighted on one, so click enter or click the one button. And now we can just methodically type in these numbers. You can see that we have a black cursor underneath L1, so if you type in 289 and then the decimal point and then 5 and then hit enter key, you can see that this acts like a spreadsheet. So you can keep typing these data, and I would keep them in order, though it is not necessary to keep them in order. The calculator will do all calculations no matter how you enter your data. And I want to show you that, let's say I accidentally typed two decimals, and I need to fix it. If I hit enter, it'll tell me I made a mistake. You quit, or you could have clicked go to, and then you can go and hit enter again, and you can see that the number is not there. So go back and find your place, but what if you typed in the number and didn't hit any decimal. 
Well, to go back and change, you just move the cursor keys using your arrows, and then you can just type over the numbers you had before. Okay, so if you need to clear data, now you can see I only have three pieces of data listed here so far. Um, I will get the other, uh, <laughs> the other 51 pieces, but I wanted to show you that if you ever need to clear an entire list of data, move your cursor all the way up to the black L1. Make sure your list one is black, so the cursor goes all the way beyond the data up into the top um, column here, or top, top row, excuse me. Click Clear, and then click Enter, and that will clear the data. It is easy to click the wrong key and delete the data, and if you have problems with that, please email me and I'll get, show you how to get that back. So now it is, uh, I have actually typed in all the data into list four. So if I um, recall it right now, here's all of the data in list four. Now here's the calculator shortcut that will get you your median Q1 and Q3 if you've typed in all your data points correctly. So again, please make sure after you've typed in all your data points, that you make sure they are right. So, you know, use the arrow key to scroll down or scroll up if you want to, to get to the bottom set part of your data. And you can just check every single data point before you do your calculations. Or especially if you make a mistake uh, or get a problem wrong, you can, you know, check your data points first. So here is the calculator shortcut. The calculator shortcut I will write down first. The calculator shortcut is the following. I'll give it a nice color so it pops a little bit. If you hit the sec, if you hit the, um, let me see, is it the, it's the stat key first. Hit the stat key. Then move your arrow once to the right to the calculation key. And then press the one button. If you press the one button, it will take you to something called one variable stats. And that's what we want to do. We want to run the some statistics on this one variable problem, and the variable is this uh, sample data set. So we're going to now follow those instructions by clicking the stat button, clicking the right arrow button, and then clicking the one button. Or it's actually highlighted already, just you can just hit enter. Now your list has to be list one. If it doesn't say list one, like my calculator does not say list one, click the second key and then click the one key. And then move down to calculate. Don't worry about frequency list. And in fact, older TI-83 calculators don't even give you these options. They just kind of spit you out to the list one by default. If you hit enter, what's cool is you get a bunch of information that's going to be really important for some standard deviation work we'll be doing later but you're mostly interested in the quartile work. So you can see that there's a down arrow key here. Click the down arrow key a few times, and then you can see that the sample size is now at the top instead of the bottom of the screen. That verifies with what we typed in, so that's a good sign. And our minimum is 289.5, our maximum is 431.2, and here you have your Q1 and Q3. So what did this give you that doing this by hand didn't give you? Well, if the data set is not in order, then this will find all of that Q1 and Q3 and median data without you having to put the data in order. And as you do have some homework problems with some pretty large data sets, you do have to um, find your Q1 and Q3 by putting your data in order or allowing the calculator to do it. Now, it is unfortunate that there is no way that your calculator right now can display an outlier or tell you what an outlier is. But there's one way, but it includes a little bit more work. So for the rest of this video, I'm going to kind of jump into some kind of like further work if you want to see how the calculator can show you what the outlier is. And it has to do with the graph output command. So if you click on the Y equals key, you should have no formulas in your Y equals one through Y7. And you may want to actually just scroll down a little bit just to make sure you don't have any formulas in any of these parts. Now, I'm not going to be writing down any steps here because this is going to be completely above and beyond what you need to know for this homework. But in case you're curious, here's some extra information. I clicked the Y equal key and I looked to see that there were no functions because we can't have those on the screen. Now I want this plot one to be black. Now if it isn't black, you're going to have to hit enter. 
and if it, because uh, most of the time it will not be highlighted. So you can cl click enter to turn it on. Now we're going to go beyond it and go second y equals. And we have our plot one turned on, but it doesn't look like the right kind of plot we want. The right kind of plot we want is a box and whisker plot, which is actually something we learned in this section. So click enter. Now you can see that my plot is still on, and if for any reason that it was off, make sure that you move over and turn that cursor on. You'll notice that plots two and three are not highlighted. That's good, you don't want those on right now. Now, we wanna do a box and whisker plot, but we don't want the box and whisker plot that actually looks like a box and whisker plot, which would be the um, second option in this second row. What we want is the first box and whisker plot option in the second row, because what this box and whisker plot will do is it will tabulate if there are outliers, it will tabulate where they are. Now, the last thing we need to do is we need to clean up our window. Now our window needs to go from 289.5 to 431.2. So our X minimum, let's put that at maybe 275, and our X maximum should be 450. Going by 25s would be acceptable. Our Y minimum and Y maximum isn't really that important, but let's go from zero to five by ones just so we can see it up on the screen. Now if we hit graph, there's our box and whisker plot. I can click the trace key and see that my minimum is exactly what I thought it was going to be, 289.5. RQ1 is marked at 338.5, and again, I click the trace key and I'm using my arrows to follow my way around the box and whisker plot. My median is 360.3, which is exactly what I figured. Between the two 360.3s is 360.3. RQ3 is 393 and our maximum is 4. 131.2. So there are no outliers because in this box and whisker plot there are no dots that are disconnected from the box and whisker plot. So let's modify the data so that there is an outlier. So if I click on stat and click on enter and I go to my first point instead of 289.5 what if I typed in accidentally um, 29.5 Okay, so this means I would have to change my window down to zero instead of 25, or sorry, instead of 275. Because now when I hit graph, you see that that accidental typo has created this dot. And if I hit trace, now it has my minimum at 29.5, which is an outlier. Okay, so the minimum, not including the outlier, is 291.7. So you can see that this point, 289.5, is now the minimum, but it's also the outlier. In fact, I'm curious if I change this 29 points, 20, 291.7, if I change that to 29.7, so if I just accidentally, when I was typing it in, if I drop that one there, 29.7. I'm wondering if that would show up as an outlier too. So we hit the graph and we hit the trace button. And they are there, but they are um, really close to each other. So you got your 29.7, and you have your 29.5. So it looks like we have two outliers here, 29.7, 29.5. So we have now two outliers, but they're too graphically close together for us to see them. But we do have them. And so that's why having the data in front of us listed in numerical order can be kind of important because there were two outliers in the set. And that's very cool if the data is not sorted. But luckily this data was sorted. So I can change these back anytime to 289.5 and 291.7 and I get back to my old graph. But you'll notice that I don't have the dots here anymore. And in fact, I really shouldn't have had all this white space here because I didn't need to have my x-axis go down to zero. All right, thank you very much for watching this video on finding outliers with big data sets using your technology.